Like all the other speakers, I would like to uh, so express my thanks to the organizers for have, uh, giving the opportunity to speak at this conference. Um, I originally thought I was going to translate my first slide in Latin to reflect the ambience of this auditorium. But then it turns out that uh, I couldn't find a good translation for the word entropy. So apparently in the uh, old Roman Empire there was no notion of entropy yet. So I kind of gave up. I thought maybe I could replace it by in say curitas or something like that, but I didn't quite uh, know what to make of it. So in this um, presentation I'd like to say uh, some, uh, something about the notion of the entropy of a hole in space-time. This is based on some work I did together with Vijay Balasubramanian, Borun Chaudhuri, Bartek Cech, and Michal Heller. Um, and I should also mention three related papers that I will probably mention later on as well. Um, and what's the idea? So there are many interesting relations, and we have heard many of those today already, between black hole entropy, entanglement entropy, and space-time geometry. And very often, we define entanglement entropy, in a, it's usually defined in the quantum field theory. We take a certain spatial region A, we take its complement, and we look at the entanglement between the spatial region A and its complement. But it has been suggested that one could perhaps also define entanglement entropy in a theory of quantum gravity. It's not a priori exactly clear what that should be, but the idea is, and this was uh, first proposed, I think, in a paper by uh, Bianchi and Rob Myers, is that if you have a theory of quantum gravity, and you take a particular spatial domain A and its complement, that in the theory of quantum gravity there could also be a notion of entanglement between the quantum gravitational degrees of freedom inside the domain A and its complement, and in particular that this entanglement entropy should be given by A over 4G. So this has nothing to do with black holes. This would be true in vacuum. The motivation for this particular uh, conjecture um, is as follows, and in particular it's quite remarkable because this is a finite number, whereas in quantum field theory, entanglement entropy is always UV divergent. This finite, the motivation for this particular proposal is as follows. Um, if you look in a quantum field theory, then the expansion of entanglement entropy is always in terms of a UV cutoff, and it roughly has this form. But if you're in a theory of quantum gravity, quantum gravity kind of comes with its built-in UV regulator, and the built-in UV cutoff in quantum gravity is believed to be something like the Planck length. So if we insert the natural UV cutoff of quantum gravity into this leading divergence, then we see that it becomes finite and it behaves roughly like A over the Newton constant. And anything that looks like A over the Newton constant obviously needs to be exactly equal to A over 4G because that's always the number that appears somehow. Um, but this argument obviously does not tell you that there should be a 4 there, but um, the conjecture would be reasonable uh, because in this way you could hopefully connect this particular computation eventually to black hole entropy. But I would like to emphasize there's no black hole here. Um, we were just going to look at a particular spatial region in the theory of quantum gravity and explore the entanglement between those degrees of freedom and its complement. Um, so if you could do this computation somehow, it would be a very interesting uh, probe of space-time geometry and also of the degrees of freedom in quantum gravity. For example, as we also heard earlier today, um, it's not entirely obvious that the degrees of freedom in quantum gravity should factor precisely uh, in terms of the degrees of freedom localized in the spatial domain and its complement. There could be many non-local degrees of freedom in quantum gravity, and those non-local degrees of freedom cannot be factorized um, in a piece that lives in A and its complement. So in particular, we might be able to probe to what extent it's a good approximation to assume that you can localize the degrees of freedom and all degrees of freedom of quantum gravity in a particular spatial domain and its complement, and whether it makes sense to write down a tensor product decomposition of the full quantum gravity Hilbert space of the form H domain tensor H complement. Now, it's a priori not clear how we should go about to study this particular question. So the idea is as follows. We're going to try to sort of take a philosophy which is based on uh, looking at Rindler space-time. So it's well known that in Rindler space-time there is an entanglement between the left half and the right half of Minkowski space-time. And one way to see that entanglement directly is to use an accelerated observer 
um, who is causally disconnected from the left half of space-time. And this observer, who is causally disconnected from the left half of space-time, will see an Unruh temperature. Uh, and the logic is that since you're causally disconnected from the left half of space-time, the degrees of freedom that this accelerated observer effectively sees are the degrees of freedom that you get by tracing over the left-hand side because those degrees of freedom are invisible, so you might as well trace over those. And that is kind of a rough explanation of why you see a finer temperature. Now, um, so we want to now try to generalize this philosophy to a more general situation. So we take, we're going to take some spatial region in the theory of quantum gravity, and it will soon be ADS. And we're going to look at observers that are causally disconnected from this particular region. Now, there is no single observer that is causally disconnected from only the region A. For a single accelerating observer, you're always causally disconnected from entire Rindler wedge. However, if you look at all observers that are causally disconnected from this region, so that's a family of observers, then all these observers together can be causally disconnected from precisely A. So we take a region in space-time, I'll show a picture in a minute, you take a region in, in space, and you look, at, you look at all observers that accelerate away from this particular spatial region. And the combined knowledge of all these observers together should somehow tell you something about the entanglement between the region A and its complement. Because all those observers together can access all degrees of freedom that do not live in A. So, so this family of observers, and that's really different from what we usually do in entanglement entropy, this family of observers should effectively see a reduced density matrix, whatever that exactly means, uh, where all the degrees of freedom associated to this domain that they cannot see have been traced over. And the entropy of this reduced density matrix is then a, a candidate quantity for the generalization of entanglement entropy to a spatial domain in quantum gravity. So then the question is, how do you associate entropy to a family of observers? Now, a particular setup where you can be more precise is to, for example, specialize to ADS3. So the spatial region of interest in ADS3 will be a disk. We take a spatial slice through global ADS3, which is a disk. We take a small disk in the middle. And then what you see here is all kinds of uh, causal domains on the boundary. And all observers that accelerate away from this particular region in the middle, they have to start and end inside one of these causal diamonds. Because in ADS, uh, and the boundary of this is the light cone, in ADS, if you accelerate away from a particular spatial domain, you always end up uh, at the boundary at some finite moment in boundary time. So from the boundary point of view, all these local observers are kind of restricted to looking at what's going on in a single causal diamond on the boundary. But these local, so these local observers, and here are two typical local observers, these local observers, they, uh, they live in a finite causal diamond, and depending on how exactly we choose the geometry of this entire region, here I took a perfect circle, but it could be an arbitrary wobbly shape, um, what you will get is that you will get on the boundary of ADS3, which is a two-dimensional conformal field theory, you will get an infinite family of causal diamonds, and each of these causal diamonds corresponds to a single observer who is sort of accelerating in and out in ADS3. And the sizes of these causal diamonds can vary as a function of the spatial angle on the boundary, because the shape of this circle in the middle can also vary. So what we have is an interesting question. We now uh, want to associate some notion of entropy to a field theory that has a limitation in the time direction, but not in the space direction. So sort of by embedding this, this question of what's the entanglement in quantum gravity in ads CFT, instead of in the boundary field theory, you do not find any conventional notion of spatial entanglement. Instead, we seem to get something which looks more like an entanglement in time. But unfortunately, we don't have a quantity that gives us something like entanglement in time. You might roughly imagine that if you have a finite time separation, 
that, that immediately uh, implies that you have a limit on how accurately you can measure energies and so on. And that this finite time separation is somehow related uh, to a separation between UV and IR degrees of freedom. But it's very difficult to make that precise. I don't, do not know if there's a way to make that precise in this particular context. So regardless of the original motivation, this is already an interesting question in itself. Is there a reasonable quantum information theoretic notion that we can associate to a field theory with a finite extent in time? So here we'll try to come up with some definition. So we're going to look at all these individual observers. Um, and the proposal is as follows. In situations like this, where you have this family of observers, you can associate something that I'm going to call residual entropy to the system, which is a measure of the lack of knowledge of the state of the system, given the combined information of all the local observers. So the idea is all these local observers, they can make arbitrary measurements, and then they can all get together, they can compare notes, and the question is to what extent they can reconstruct the full state of the system. And the claim is that all that you can try to combine all this information, but none of these observers can measure long-range correlations in the system. So if you gather all the information of all these local observers, you still cannot fully reconstruct the state of the system, and the extent to which this is impossible is something that I'm going to call residual entropy. Can you compute this residual entropy? Um, well, suppose, for example, that each observer would be able to determine the complete reduced density matrix on each of these spatial intervals. That's very ambitious. It's unlikely that each observer can measure the reduced density matrix on each of these spatial intervals, but imagine that's true. Then the question would be, look at all possible density matrices of the full system whose reduced density matrices to one of the spatial intervals of one of these local observers reproduces exactly the reduced density matrix that that observer sees. And then among all these density matrices you could look for the one that maximizes the entropy. Um, so this is you look and this maximum, this is kind of the maximum uncertainty that you have in all the information that is available to all these local observers. Well. Here is just uh, in case you might think that, well, clearly if you know all these local reduced density matrices, then clearly you know the full state of the system. And here's a simple example to see that that does not work. So suppose the actual state of the system, of a three-spin system, is this particular pure state. Now if you project this three-spin state on spin 1, 2, spin 2, 3, and spin 3, 1, then the corresponding projections are written here. That's easy to work out, they're all the same. But you can see that there's also a mixed state that gives you exactly the same projections, which is written at the bottom here. So you see that um, just by making these measurements of two spin subsystems, it is impossible to distinguish this state from this particular state. So this would be an example where you would say there's some residual uncertainty in the problem. In this case, you would say it's log two because this, uh, that's the... Uh, entropy associated to this density matrix, but this is kind of the rough idea. So the working hypothesis for now is that all local observers can reduce the full reduced density matrix, and now we want to try to see if we can say something about the maximum entropy of a density matrix that is compatible with all these measurements. So this is a bit tricky because there's infinitely many of those local observers. Uh, and the spatial intervals that they can see overlap. So how do we go about computing this? So what we're going to do is we're going to use strong subadditivity to put a bound on the entropy of the full system given all the information of the local observers. So strong subadditivity, which is this inequality, you can apply to this infinite family of overlapping intervals that covers the boundary. And each interval is the spatial domain that's accessible to one single observer. And uh, skipping a few details, if you put that all together and you iterate strong subadditivity a couple of times, then you end up with the following upper bound for this notion of residual entropy. So the entropy that is uh, sort of inaccessible, given 
all information of local observers is less than or equal to this particular Fermi combination here. It's basically, you, you add all the information of all the local observers, and then you subtract all the information that they share, because that's kind of overcounting. And this quantity by itself is, is already particularly interesting, so this I'm going to give a different name. So this is a well-defined thing called differential entropy. This notion of residual entropy is a bit uh, less well-defined. Uh, it's, it's informally defined as the amount of information inaccessible to local observers, but you uh, want to write down a precise equation for it. And as I said, I am using a working hypothesis that uh, all these observers can access the full reduced density matrix, but it's quite unlikely that that's actually true. So this notion of residual entropy presumably needs improvement. In any way, this leads to this particular quantity called differential entropy, and you can easily compute it because we know exactly how, what the entanglement entropy of an interval in a two-dimensional conformal field theory is. It's given here. Um, so now you just take a particular strip on the boundary, and, and it can have an arbitrary profile given by a function alpha of theta. And this function alpha of theta is a non-trivial function of the geometry of the disk in the middle. So if you take an arbitrary wobbly disk in the middle, you have to carefully trace out all the light cones to the boundary to find the domain on the boundary that is causally disconnected from the interior of this wobbly disk. So there is a non-trivial map between this function alpha of theta and the geometry of the region you start out with, but you can work out what that is. So now you have all these causal diamonds here and all these different lengths of intervals. And then if you then take this quantity called differential entropy, you evaluate it for this particular series of observers, and you take a continuum limit, then you get the following upper bound for this residual entropy in terms of the shape of this strip on the boundary, which is given here. And now, interestingly enough, and this is kind of a non-trivial computation, is that if you use the relation of this function alpha of theta to the actual geometry of the disk in the interior, you insert it, you do some partial integrations and some other things, then out comes exactly a over 4G, where A in this case is the length of the boundary of the disk in the interior. So that's quite remarkable, and it suggests that perhaps this A over 4G is not really something like, it doesn't really seem to correspond to an entanglement entropy in the traditional sense. In particular, if you believe this computation, you cannot associate A over 4G to the entropy of a tensor factor in the conformal field theory Hilbert space. And that seems to point to the fact that perhaps the degrees of freedom of gravity are in fact rather non-local and very difficult to localize in this particular spatial domain A. If you could cleanly put them in A and in the complement, then you would have expected to find here somehow the entropy associated to a tensor factor in the dual field theory, but you do not. And you can also uh, basically draw some pictures to understand why this works. Because if you um, have a shape in the middle, so this is like a geometrical interpretation of why this particular computation works, and you draw all these uh, black lines, which represents geodesics, which according to Ryu Takinagi compute the entanglement entropy, and you subtract, which is the red dotted curves, all the entanglement entropies associated to the overlaps of intervals, and you take a continuum limit, you can sort of see that the difference between the two becomes the length of the blue curve. So I'd like to, like to make a few comments. Um, so as I said already, this notion of residual entropy most likely needs improvement. Uh, it's unlikely that you can really access the full reduced density matrix of an interval in a finite amount of time. Uh, for example, if you uh, look at the standard time-energy uncertainty relation, and since these observers have only a finite amount of time to make measurements, it's unlikely that they can fully resolve this reduced density matrix. Uh, you can also think about possible bulk definitions of residual entropy, and uh, they were, some of them were discussed in a recent paper by Veronica. Um, so this is something I already said. Um, and then a few other things is that um, if you start to make this interior domain, the boundary fit too weird, then some of the things become kind of singular. 
strangely enough, this that differential entropy quantity can be generalized to basically take care of any shape of curve, except that at some point it will start to have positive and negative contributions, so the interpretation becomes a bit unclear in that case. And finally, uh, the way I presented it, in the way I presented it, this notion of residual entropy was related to observers, causality, and so on. Um, but differential entropy was based on entanglement entropy. And entanglement entropy is not based on causal constructions, but on extremal surfaces, extremal minimal surfaces. And so you can wonder whether, in general, we should use a causal construction to do what I just described, or whether I should use a construction based on geodesics and minimal surfaces. In ADS3, these things are the same, so you cannot distinguish them. Uh, but it was pointed out by uh, Rob Myers and company that if you go to higher dimensions, they looked at some higher dimensional examples, that what one should use is not a causal construction, but one should really be using extremal surfaces to generalize this discussion to higher dimensions. Uh, yep, let me skip that. So, and then I want to point out a mild generalization and to, to say something about the limitations of this. So a generalization you could look at is to look at more complicated geometries and not just global ADS. Um, and if you look, for example, at the conical defect geometry, there's a new feature that appears, namely with just geodesics, minimal, uh, minimal length geodesics, you cannot probe a particular region in the middle. That's a general obstruction that you also have for black holes. And in particular, if you want to uh, reconstruct uh, or prove that the Einstein equation in the bulk is satisfied, like the way Mark described earlier today, it's only limited to the outside of this gray region. And then you can ask, is there any way to generalize our construction to probe inside this gray region? And um, that's a bit tricky, but the hint is as follows. Um, if you look at this particular picture, there's also, uh, in this particular geometry, there are long geodesics. You can have long geodesics that wind around this conical defect or around the black hole if you want a couple of times. We do not have, at present, a good quantum information theoretic interpretation of the lengths of these long geodesics, but those seem to be the natural quantities that allow you to probe this gray region. So it's a very interesting question what the precise quantum information theoretic meaning of these long geodesics is. A hint comes from the following observation that if you lift this conical defect geometry to the covering space, uh, these conical defect geometries are basically a quotient of ADS, so you can undo the quotient and go to the covering space, and in the covering space they correspond to ordinary geodesics. This covering space can be sort of thought of as a particular long string sector of the corresponding conformal field theory. So the suggestion is that if you want to probe this region, you should somehow look at entanglement but not in the original conformal field theory, but somehow in, in spatial regions in the long string. And uh, exactly what the right definition of that is not entirely clear, but you can make up like an ad hoc definition. Uh, and if you use that and then go through the sort of song and dance I went through before, you again can reproduce the length of all kinds of curves, even if they sit inside this gray region. Um, and it's, however, going to the long string is a bit tricky because the actual theory here is a Zn quotient of the long string. So to go to the long string, you sort of have to undo the Zn gauging. Um, and this is perhaps related to all kinds of discussions about entanglement entropy in gauge theories. It's actually rather tricky to define entanglement entropy in gauge theories. One very often has to do some sort of ungaging in order to come up with a good definition. And that is perhaps related to what I'm describing here. Um, right. So let me skip this a little bit. This is just trying to say something about uh, the interpretation of this density matrix. Um, the, the interesting observation, if you want, is that if you remove a piece of space and you still are left with a full density matrix and not a reduced density matrix, there is nothing that you can use to purify it. Normally, if you have a reduced density matrix and you want to see the rest of space time, you can do that by purifying the thing that you have and you will recover the original ground state. Here you cannot do it unless, in this case, you associate an extra copy of the Hilbert space temporarily to sort of the boundary of this disk uh, and really associate a state in the tensor product of these two guys to this outside region. And then you can make sort of a consistent picture 
which suggests that if you want to describe uh, boundaries of space-time, you should always temporarily associate an extra copy of the Hilbert space to these boundaries. Uh, and gluing together pieces of space-time is like gluing together these Hilbert spaces again. And in this way, you can sort of get an interesting, consistent picture, uh, which gives a somewhat different view on perhaps how you should try to think about local bulk geometry. Um, let me see. So then let me start by mentioning a few open problems. So there is an interesting quantum information theory problem. How do you associate entropy to families of, of observers, to field theories with a finite extent in time? More generally, uh, to vector spaces of observables. There is an abstract construction in quantum field theory that states that to any closed subalgebra of the algebra of observables, you can associate the notion of entropy. Doesn't have to be. Uh, uh, does not have to uh, have anything to do with a spatial region, but whenever you have a closed subalgebra, there's a notion of entropy. But here we do not have a closed subalgebra. These observers do not, uh, they cannot combine their measurements. Uh, along the same lines, is there an interesting quantum information theoretic meaning of this notion of differential entropy that goes beyond this alternating sum that I gave you? And is it possible to somehow now reconstruct the bulk geometry more directly? The way we did it using accelerated observers is somewhat reminiscent of the way Jacobson derived Einstein equations way back when in 95, I think. So is there a way to connect that derivation to this particular setup? And then there's all kinds of generalizations. And I'll stop there. Thank you. We have time for a few questions. Apparently there is a question there, but with the light I cannot. <laughs> oh, please. Uh, sorry, I didn't understand the justification for not allowing the observers to measure uh, correlations between their different intervals. Uh, if they can get together to you know, put together their reduced density matrices, they can presumably also get together to you know, put together correlations between different local experiments that they did. Uh, so could you explain the intuitive justification for not allowing them to measure long range correlations, but allowing them to measure the reduced density matrix? Yeah, I think this particular uh, spin illustration, in this particular case, if, if all you can do is a finite set of measure, so you first, it's not, uh, the idea is not that you can make measurements, get together, go out again, make new measurements, and get together, right? You do, you do independently some measurements from each other, and then you get together. So clearly, these, these local observers, they cannot see more than this reduced density matrix. There's nothing else they can measure. So there's no way for these two uh, observers to get together to combine to determine whether the state was that or that. Does that answer the question? Or? Measure correlations between different things. So they measured one of them could measure one spin and the other could measure the other spin. And then they could get together and talk about you know, whether the answers were correlated or not, right? Which would be, more, which would be broader than the reduced density matrix. Uh, I don't think that any of that will, will separate these two guys from each other. Let's talk about it later. Yeah. Who is, who wants to I, I wanted to make a comment about the previous comment. So, I mean, you could say the rule is first one observer makes a measurement, right? Yeah. On the quantum state. Then another observer makes another measurement. They don't make correlated measurements between the state at the same time. That's right. Well, if not, let's uh, thank Jan again.